Members, the next item on the order paper is a motion on no fault divorce. Clerk, will you please read the motion? That this assembly acknowledges that divorce can be a difficult process for any individual or family to go through, recognises that the current fault based divorce process can often exacerbate conflict and have a hugely negative impact on the well being of children. Notes that in the No Fault Divorce Law, Divorce, Dissolution and Separation Act 2020 came into effect in England and Wales in 2022. Understand that children who grow up with parents who have low parental conflict, whether together or separated, enjoy better health and education outcomes. And calls on the Minister of Finance to bring forward legislation to amend the Matrimonial Causes Northern Ireland Order 1978 to allow applications for a divorce without apportioning blame on either party. Thank you. Um, I'll call on Nicola Brogan to move the motion. Thank you, Nicola. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. You will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind, and all other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate in the motion, Nicola. Divorce can be a difficult process for any family to go through, especially when there are children involved. The statistics for divorce show that, on average, 2,100 couples will seek a divorce every year here in the North. This figure has increased over time as society has become more secular. Under current laws, divorce can only be granted if the marriage has been irretrievably broken down, with one party taking the blame. An applicant seeking a divorce must state the grounds which they are applying under, and they must provide evidence to the court which supports their application. Divorces can only be granted if they meet one or more of five separate grounds, which are adultery, unreasonable behaviour, two years desertion, two years separation if both parties consent, and five years separation if only one party consents. This process often puts the parties at loggerheads, creating feelings of resentment into what is already an emotional situation and can have a hugely negative impact on the children within the family as well as those, as, as well as those seeking a divorce. Sinn Féin wants to see laws which encourage amicable and healthy relationships between former spouses and which reduce conflict, particularly where children are involved. Another aspect of our current divorce laws which cause great frustration is the length of time required to complete the process. Even under the most amicable separations, the current law requires former partners to live separately for two years before an application for divorce can be considered. This is increased to five years when one party contests the divorce. This is, in fact, trapping former partners in a broken down marriage, which can have a hugely negative impact on both the physical and mental well being of those affected. The process of divorce should be as efficient and as pain free as possible and should prioritise the welfare of those involved, particularly children and victims of domestic abuse. Our current laws on divorce came into force in 1978 and are outdated. We need modern divorce laws which reflect the society that we live in today. This motion is calling on the Minister of Finance to bring forward legislation which would introduce no-fault divorce. No-fault divorce is a much more straightforward and amicable approach to separation. Under no-fault divorce, former spouses can file for divorce independently or jointly, without the need for one party to blame the other. This ensures that divorces can proceed on a less contentious basis and within a much quicker time frame. No, thank you. It also prevents an abuser from contesting a divorce, thereby preventing them from using the court system to further harm their victims. No-fault divorce was recently introduced in England and Wales via the Divorce, Dissolution and Separation Act 2020. This followed a Supreme Court case, uh, Owens v Owens, where a petition for divorce was contested and the court then ruled in favour of the contesting party on the grounds that they could not reasonably be considered at fault for the breakdown of the marriage. In the Supreme Court judgment, the court strongly recommended that the divorce laws be reformed. The modernisation of divorce laws, and in particular no-fault divorce, is gaining traction across many jurisdictions. In addition to England and Wales, no-fault divorce has been introduced in countries such as America, Canada, Australia and many European countries. Now is the time for the North to follow suit, and I urge members in the House to support this motion. Thank you, Nicola. I called Cheryl Brownlee. Marriage is supposed to be a happy and a special occasion where two people come together in front of their loved ones and commit themselves to each other and then set up their lives together. But we would be naive to think that all marriages will last forever. And while no one sets out thinking that their marriage is going to end and nobody wants their marriage to break down, 
None of us are indifferent when a couple's lifelong commitment has sadly deteriorated after all avenues have been exhausted. Sadly, people change, circumstances change, and sometimes a life that may have once seemed so perfect may not necessarily be that way forever. It's a very sad circumstance, but this motion brings forward a solution that can help couples navigate through what is an extremely traumatic and difficult time. There's no reason why, in situations where there is no fault, two people, usually forced into a hostile situation where they have to assign blame, keeping them married for longer and preventing them from moving on with their lives, causing further distress to them and their families. Choosing whether or not to marry is a very big decision, but choosing whether or not to divorce is an even bigger decision, and not one ever made lightly. I believe that we should do everything we can to try and rebuild the relationships before they become beyond repair. More support should be allocated to counselling services, to provide trained help for those <coughs> in marriage difficulties, and to prioritise saving a marriage. Counsellors help parties to understand the implications of what marriage means, what the difficulties occur, of, and of what splitting up would mean for them and their families, their children, and of course their wider families. No, thank you. They can also help people to consider what a split will involve practically regarding contact arrangements, finances, and whether the option of staying together might be something that they could look at. It can also give them the tools to help work through the problems since they may or not may not have had that role model in their life before. And anything to help to improve and preserve a marriage where possible should of course be explored. We all know someone who has had a divorce, whether it be a parent, a child, a friend, or even ourselves in this very chamber. It's a situation that when someone takes that important vow, they never plan or want to be in. The stress of the process can be detrimental to both mental and physical health, as well as a significant financial cost, and in some circumstances, leaving people feeling very trapped and causing further pain and hurt. This motion can help reduce the potential conflict and the detrimental impact that this could have, of course, of those involved, but their children and their wider families. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cheryl, I call Owen Tennyson. Thank you, Principal, Deputy Speaker, and the Alliance Party supports the introduction of no-fault divorce as committed to in our 2022 Assembly Manifesto and welcomes this opportunity to debate the issue today. The existing procedure and law managing divorce and the dissolution of civil partnerships is not fit for purpose and is in clear need of updating. The fundamental problem is, of course, and as has already been set out, the requirement to prove that a marriage has broken down either by establishing fault on the part of one partner or by showing that the couple have lived separate lives for a prolonged number of years. Those who cannot afford to live in two separate households for years in order to prove that their marriage has broken down are left with the only option available to them, which is to establish fault. Establishing one of the three faults, be it adultery, unreasonable behaviour or desertion, can be difficult and often creates further tensions at a time when emotions are already incredibly high for partners and their families. Indeed, it can be acrimonious, fractious and a prolonged process, particularly for children, with 21 per cent of respondents to the Finding Fault survey stating that they believe that establishing fault had made it difficult to sort arrangements for children, and 78 per cent saying um, that it made the process more bitter. In some cases, and as has already been referenced, there are examples of separated couples having to resort to establishing fault that is not necessarily based in fact in order to speed up the process. There are also widespread concerns about the potential for exploitation of the current system, where it be, whereby it can be used as a means for a perpetrator of domestic abuse to continue to exercise coercive control um, through the legal process or result in a victim of domestic abuse being effectively trapped in a marriage for a prolonged period. Additionally, for victims to have to recount specific details of abuse through the divorce process can compound mental and emotional distress, reopening incredibly traumatising experiences. England and Wales have already moved to introduce no-fault divorce procedures, and we can and should learn from their experience and ensure that this is not another example of Northern Ireland being left behind the rest of these islands. No, I, I won't give way, and I'm usually keen to give way in debate, but the last time I tried to intervene on the member, he would not give way and engage in a debate, and he was also quite personally rude, um, so I have no intention of giving way to the member on this occasion. In considering reform um, in this jurisdiction, we must deliver divorce laws that ensure couples can separate as amicably as possible, that seek to minimise conflict,
that uphold and protect the dignity, human rights and equality of those involved, that maximise the chances of agreement being reached and keep the risk of domestic abuse as low as possible. Where there are children involved, their interests, of course, must be paramount, and a safe and secure outcome for them should be promoted. There is a clear public interest, therefore, in supporting people to achieve amicable resolutions to financial and care arrangements following a separation. The introduction of no-fault divorce, I believe, is a clear step along that road to move away from prolonged periods of animosity and blame. It is not, however, the end of the journey. Tackling some of the issues that have been raised, be it around inequality, domestic abuse, promoting healthy relationships and dealing with the well-being and life chances of children will require a joined up and cross-executive effort and I sincerely hope that this debate can be the start of that journey. Thank you. Thank you. Owen, I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. The SDLP will be supporting uh, the motion today and I welcome the fact that it has been brought forward. I look forward, hopefully, in the Minister summing up to hear um, a specific legislative intent from the Minister to bring um, legislation around no-fault divorce forward during the course of this uh, mandate. I think the motion is right to uh, acknowledge that uh, divorce is a difficult, often traumatic process for those who have to go through it. As Cheryl Brownlee said in her remarks, um, no one uh, undertakes or enters into a marriage expecting or hoping that that marriage um, will end, but the reality of life uh, the reality of um, human relationships is that those relationships do end. It is in the interests of those people, it is particularly in the interests of any children who are involved and indeed their wider um, families and friends, that when those relationships come to an end and it ends in divorce, that that process is as amicable and, frankly, as smooth as possible. It is clear that our divorce law is a product of an earlier time, uh, a time with uh, different um, uh, moral and legal expectations. And I think it is only right that we now update the legal framework to make this process much smoother. There are particular circumstances which do need to be borne in mind and which argue for the introduction of no-fault divorce. One is, yes, I will give way. Can the member think of any legal arrangement whereby someone objects to the dissolution of that arrangement? but is denied the right to object and is denied the right to have judicial arbitration or decision-making upon their objection. Is there any other legal arrangement where that, does, where that applies? And uh, the member has an extra minute. Uh, I uh, appreciate the, the extra minute and uh, the member has much more legal training than me. I think the answer to the question is there is no other contract that exists in law that is like a marriage. There is no other contract in law that is the same, that is a contract between parties that involves human emotion and often children in the same way that a marriage does. So I think comparing it to uh, a deed uh, in relation to a house or anything else is, uh, I'm afraid, to completely miss the point. We're talking about human beings and their lives uh, and children. So uh, treating it like uh, another matter to be litigated is exactly the problem in many cases, because there are situations in which, for example, one party, often but not always, uh, the woman in the relationship is in an, abuse, in, 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 in an abusive or a, a, a situation. I'm sure most of us as elected representatives have had to be in a situation where we have dealt with constituents in the extraordinarily difficult situation of being, a, when I say extraordinarily difficult, I'm, I'm putting it far too uh, mildly in the uh, life-altering and traumatic situation of being in an, abusive situ in an abusive relationship. In many cases for those people, they don't have the option of waiting uh, for, uh, for two years in order to, to, to have a separation period, nor often do they have the financial wherewithal or the emotional wherewithal in some cases to find somewhere else to, to live, often with, um, with children alongside them. So when we legislate for people here, we're not simply legislating for dry, hypothetical situations or um, legally perfect situations. We're legislating for ordinary human beings. Everything we should have at the front of our mind should be about making the lives um, of, our, of our citizens and our constituents um, more straightforward and also uh, better and reducing, um, and reducing damage, to the, reducing difficulty for them when we can. And I think that no-fault divorce, which will, make the situ which will make divorce, frankly, smoother, simpler and cheaper for many people in the often sad, sometimes very sad uh, situation that a relationship has come to an end, and to make it as amicable as, uh, amicable as possible which is in everyone's interests. It's in the interests of 
the, the couple who are sadly divorcing. It's certainly in the interests of their children. Frankly, it's in the interests of society and the legal system. We were hearing from the Justice Minister earlier on about the extreme burdens on the legal system in terms of, uh, in terms of delays in uh, the judicial system. I think anything we can do to ease the burden in that regard is also an added benefit to introducing no-fault divorce. So I welcome the motion. I think in 2024 it is overdue. I think in this place it would be a positive sign that we have finally, uh, at a devolved level, got our act together in terms of moving forward practically in terms of social reforms and not getting tangled up in the weeds um, uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of these reforms. So I welcome the motion. I support it uh, and I hope to hear well, my party does to uh, the opposition does, and we hope to hear from the minister that she'll be able to introduce uh, legislation to that effect uh, very very quickly. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, uh, Matthew. I call Sean Mulholland. Thank you, Principal, Madam De Principal Deputy Speaker. Oh, um, the tension and hostility that can permeate a home during a time of marriage breakdown um, can have a really lasting impact on everyone, not least children, if they're involved. Even in the most amicable of situations, children can be left feeling confused, scared and emotionally distressed. And that's the reality for so many families and children in Northern Ireland. And it is further exacerbated by our current fault-based divorce system. The change is long overdue and I thank the, the, um, the member for bringing forward this motion. Currently, our divorce process incentivises um, making allegations about the other's conduct to avoid a prolonged separation period and this fosters acrimony and conflict causing unnecessary unnecessary emotional pain and financial burden the requirement to uh, assign blame fosters a toxic environment particularly for women and children victims of domestic abuse and low-income individuals and alternatively couples may remain legally married and during an unhappy coexistence due to the law requiring the separation period of two years by consent or five without. Those extended waiting periods exacerbate the difficulties experienced by those in an already vulnerable situation, and I've seen this within my own family networks, and it is anything but healthy. A toxic divorce characterised by high levels of conflict and blame, as I've said, can cause significant emotional and psychological harm to children, and when parents are embroiled in those bitter disputes, the children are often felt as if they feel as if they are caught in the middle. Children may also be forced or feel forced to take sides and develop resentment towards one or both parents, affecting their long-term emotional bonds, trust and their academic achievement. The long-term benefits of no-fault divorce and co-parenting cannot be understated. When parents are not pitted against each other in a blame game, they are more likely to develop and maintain cooperative parenting relationships, and that cooperation is absolutely essential for the healthy development of children who benefit immensely from having both parents actively involved in their lives without the shadow of ongoing conflict. But as has been said, it's not just children that this will impact, it is also victims of domestic violence. Um, requiring fault-based facts in divorce petitions can at times escalate conflict and endanger survivors. For victims of domestic violence, if they choose not to disclose that behaviour, fearing the consequences if they do, the extended waiting periods before divorce can allow abusers to maintain control over their lives. And this period can be used by abusers to continue their coercive and controlling behaviour, further endangering the victim. We know that women, particularly, are most in danger when they've already chosen and indicated their intent to leave. Victims can be subjected to ongoing physical and emotional and psychological abuse during that waiting period. By removing the ability for abusers to contest the divorce, we would further, further um, prevent manipulation and control, enabling victims to rebuild their lives with dignity and security. And the reduction in conflict will also lead to lower legal costs, making the process much more accessible to all individuals, particularly those, as I've said, in a vulnerable situation. Um, the introduction of no-fault divorce in England and Wales has been met with widespread approval. Um, the Law Society of England and Wales reports the process has become less contentious and more focused on constructive outcomes, which is a positive for all. And other jurisdictions, such as Scotland and France, have long benefited from much more straightforward divorce proceedings that do not rely heavily on fault. By introducing no-fault divorce, we have the opportunity to align our laws with the realities faced by modern families. And this, re this, this reform is not about making divorce easier, but making it less damaging. It ensures that when there is no other option and marriage cannot be salvaged, the process of ending it does not inflict additional harm on those involved. 
The benefits of no-fault divorce are clear. Reduced conflict, lower legal costs, better emotional outcomes for children and a safer, more dignified route out of abusive relationships. We have seen the positive impacts of similar reforms and I hope that we can work together to create a system that prioritises the well-being of families, reduces unnecessary conflict and supports individuals in moving forward with their lives in a constructive and positive manner. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I call John Mallister. Marriage is a coherent thread keeping society and families often together. So it inevitably follows that when you embrace easy no-fault divorce, then you cheapen marriage. Marriage is based on solemn vows. And no-fault divorce demeans, diminishes, disregards those vows. And can inflict upon an innocent party in a marriage the greatest possible hurt, that they who took their vows seriously can now be faced with a situation under no-fault divorce, where in spite of that, and contrary to their wishes, they can be divorced without the right to ever be heard. And that is the point uh, that cuts to the very issue affecting innocent parties. Yes, I'll give one. I appreciate him giving away. Given that many more people, often in tragic circumstances, are more likely to in engage with divorce law in their lives than they are to be directly affected by, just to pick something at random, the regulation of goods moving across the Irish Sea, does he think it's more of a problem for basic rights in terms of, for example, one's ability to access divorce, that there should be a di divergence in the law between Northern Ireland and England and Wales in relation to divorce? Is, is that not a problem, but, but divergence in terms of regulation of goods is? The, the well, map is an extra minute. And is entitled to be treated by this Assembly as it so wishes. But the fundamental is this. A party in a marriage can now find themselves under no-fault divorce, divorced without the right to ever object. Because remember what Section 1 of the English legislation says. It says an application, which can come from either party or both, must be accompanied by a statement by the applicant that the marriage is broken down irretrievably. The court dealing with an application must take the statement to be conclusive evidence that the marriage is broken down irretrievably and make a divorce order. So the biggest scoundrel that's ever been in a marriage, the biggest philanderer, the most cruel individual who has mistreated his wife and his children for years can suddenly present as a petitioner claiming the marriage is irretrievably broken down and the court is obliged to accept that without ever hearing from the innocent party without ever proceeding to making an adjudication. Now, that is a step far too far. I can understand it from a legal point of view. If both parties to a marriage mutually wanted to make an application that their marriage was over. But the real menace in this is that the innocent party can have divorce against their will put upon them. And marriage breakup is the greatest cause of poverty in this country. So a wife who can uh, uh, find herself suddenly, against her will, divorced, maybe homeless, children falling into poverty. Why? Because this Assembly thinks it's a great idea to have no fault divorce and enable that infliction upon family and children. Yes, I'll get one. Um, the point that the member makes in relation to the financial settlement, is it the case that the financial settlement is different to the actual dissolution of the marriage? So the point you're making is, is contrary to the, to the actual dissolution of the marriage? Yes, the ancillary relief follows from the divorce. But once you have the divorce, which you can get after six months, you could be married today and initiate divorce tomorrow. And within six months under the English Bill, you can be divorced. And the ancillary relief, the disposal of the assets, then is next attended to. Now, do you think it's going to be an advocacy of contentment and ease of those ancillary relief processes? 
to have a wife who didn't want to be divorced, who probably has, is on the lesser share of the ancillary relief, to suddenly find she has to face that, the house that she thought was giving her cover is gone, you're putting that woman in an impossible position. Now, again, I'm back to the point. If both of them want to say, we want to disavow our vows, we want to end the marriage, that might be one thing at a, at a, at a secular level. But for one person to say, in spite of you, I will inflict divorce upon you. Anyone who thinks that will make the ancillary relief easier, that's going to build up great hostility and far more difficulties in all of that. And you have children who might have never known that their father or their mother was minded to suddenly go for divorce, suddenly has that thrust upon them. So I think this House should be very careful before rushing in to the fashionable idea that what is marriage, forget about it, walk in one door, walk out the other, and who cares? And that's the attitude of no-fault marriage, illustrated by proponents in this House who weren't even prepared to take an intervention. Oh, God. Uh, Claire Sugden. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I rise to support the motion. Um, I do want to address a point that Mr Alistair has made, um, and I'm happy to take an intervention to see if he wishes to respond to that. But a marriage is an equal partnership. Whether we like it or not, if my husband told me today he wanted to divorce, I wouldn't like that. But equally, I'm not sure I would want to be in a marriage where my husband doesn't want to be in that marriage. So are we recognising the equal partnership that a marriage is? And if that partnership becomes less equal, because one, one of the, the individuals wishes to divorce. Do we not have to respect that? <laughs> the ultimate inequality, when one party, without consulting with, without taking any heed to the objection of the other, can impose divorce, and that objecting party can never even be heard. Because the law says that the, the declaration by the petitioner that the marriage is irretrievably broken down is taken as gospel. It can't be questioned. The objector can't say, hold on a moment, I want to be heard in this. That's the inequality. The members an extra minute. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that from a litigation perspective. However, in most circumstances, this is highly emotional. This is about relationships breaking down. And those conversations about why that marriage will break down will happen within the home. And as I go on to say you know, further in, in, in my contribution, we're actually interfering by creating more hurdles. You know, if this is about um, not interfering in family life, being one of the only jurisdictions in the United Kingdom that doesn't have this, we're actually interfering in family lives. So, Mr. Alster, I, I, I appreciate the perspective in which you're coming from, but I don't agree with it. I think the point in which a couple reluctantly agrees to divorce, and I think there is a reluctance there, I don't think there's any opportunity for reconciliation. And I think to an extent we have to respect that. Let me make some progress, if, if he wouldn't mind. Um, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, um, I have been interested in this policy change since I was Minister of Justice. Um, I have raised it with the current Finance Minister, um, and I, am, I believe that she is intended to move in this direction, which I believe is very much welcome. A lot of my motivations around it, albeit it didn't fall within the remit of the Department of Justice, it fall you know, within the civil matters of, of the Minister of Finance, was the impact that it has on, on the courts, but also the impact that it has in relation to domestic abuse, and we've heard other members discuss this. It does provide an opportunity to address social, legal and practical consideration, and it is increasingly common across all jurisdictions, not just in GB, but in it's also a standard now in international law. And there are many practical reasons for this change, which I will speak to later if I have time. However, I think the most important and impactful reason is to reduce the adversarial nature of divorce, particularly when young children are involved. And I recognise that that's you know, specific in, in the motion. It removes the need to assign blame. It reduces animosity. It makes the whole process less contentious. And lowering, lowering the conflict during divorce proceedings does help a more amicable environment, which is less damaging to children involved. Of course it is. And bear in mind, that damage can exist long past degree absolute. When a process that divorce creates so much animosity, it has lasting damage and impact. 
It is difficult. I said that in my response to Mr. Alistair. And I really don't think anyone considers it flippantly. Certainly, at the point in which divorce becomes a serious option for married couples, I really doubt that reconciliation is likely. And as a, as a parliamentarian, it is not in my interest to consider whether a marriage is viable. That is entirely a matter for the couple themselves. And I will acknowledge that for many reasons, marriage does not work. And in these cases, the state needs not to interfere by creating more hurdles than necessary, particularly when we have seen other jurisdictions progress. And I do believe our current process is now interfering in that. Yeah, go ahead. Figures which were released in the House of Lords show that between 2003 and 2016 in GB, there were, each year there were 12,000 divorce processes which were commenced and never concluded, more than were, than were concluded. Is that not indicative that very often reconciliation can arise, but where you create a system where there's no window for, for reconciliation, there's no compulsion for reconciliation, is simply out the door within six months, there's no prospect of reconciliation. Um, Mr. Osler, those are really interesting figures. However, how many divorces have proceeded and concluded? And again, if there is an opportunity for reconciliation, it would be my understanding that either party can, can, can look toward that in terms of what they decide. But again, Mr. Alistair, it is an equal partnership. If one individual within that marriage doesn't want to be part of that marriage, it's no longer equal and divorce is, is imminent. Practically, and I'll get to this quickly, I do think simplifying the grounds for divorce reduces the complexity of court cases, leading to quicker resolution and less court backlog. We saw in recent days news reports of our court backlog and how, sis or how slow our system continues to be. And nothing has changed in the eight years since I was Minister of Justice. That was eight years ago. Um, if anything, it seems slower. And we need to look at practical ways of addressing this. This isn't going to fix that, but it certainly will help. And I think that that's how, how we, we can start addressing these things in, in, in Northern Ireland and start looking to societal change and our progress around our attitudes towards marriage and divorce. The one area that I really want to touch on quickly before my time's run out is domestic abuse. It's a really important reason as to why we should progress this issue. Speak to Women's Aid, speak to Nexus, speak to the, to the organisations who know better than any one of us in this House to understand how this small but impactful change could help those um, victims in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Claire. Um, I now wish to call on the Minister for Finance, Dr Kiefer Archibald, to respond. The Minister, you will have 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, I begin by thanking the proposers of the motion for bringing it to the floor of the Assembly today. This is an issue that I believe deserves further consideration by us as policymakers. The substantive law of divorce for which my department holds responsibility in the context of private family law has remained untouched since the matrimonial causes legislation that was passed in 1978. That is coming up nearly half a century ago. And as society has changed, attitudes have changed, and the world around us has changed, I believe it is now right that we take the time to reflect on societal issues like divorce and assess whether the existing law appropriately reflects those changes. It is an unfortunate reality of life that marriages can sometimes break down. While many marriages endure and last a lifetime, there are others for a variety of different reasons that will end. The same can happen with civil partnerships, and when relationships do break down, as policymakers, it is our role to consider how best to handle those circumstances. Our current law sets out a scheme that allows couples to divorce, but which also requires them in certain cases to show fault and attribute blame, and that can lead to additional and unnecessary conflict. I believe we need to assess our law in a way that minimises the potential for conflict. Divorce can at times be a protracted, difficult and painful process, taking many months or indeed years, particularly if the divorce is grounded on a fault basis. The purpose of this motion is to consider how we can enable divorces to take place in the most constructive manner, reducing conflict and enabling individuals to move on with their lives. This is particularly important in cases where divorcing couples have children. A child's best interests, I think we can agree, are best served where conflict is reduced or eradicated, where there is cooperation between divorcing parents, not tension, and where the focus of the legal process is not on apportioning blame, but on helping everyone to move on as smooth, in as smooth a way as possible. Needing to cite blame when applying for divorce um, can lead 
to more difficult situations, especially for the victims of domestic abuse, as a number of members have already referred to, and the potential for continued uh, controlling or coercive behaviour. Divorces, sorry, no fault divorces allows divorce to proceed on a less contentious basis and avoid parties being trapped in a marriage. No fault divorces are already in place in England and Wales and in the South. I have also noted the changes to the laws that have happened elsewhere. I believe in the ability of this Assembly to consider and make laws that are appropriate to hear. And while I am of the view that the changes in England and Wales appear to be a positive step forward, I recognise there may be alternative approaches we might want to consider that reflect the values and the views of our society that will deliver on the same goals of reducing conflict, being better for the parties divorcing, easier for children and minimising harm that can at times follow from bitter and contested divorces. My department has limited resources in this area and the small team that has responsibility for private family law and a range of other civil law reform matters is currently developing the legislation around our marriage laws that I hope will come, to, come before this Assembly in 2025. So with that in mind, this issue is one that I am keen to develop as a priority later in, in this mandate. I believe it is right that we examine this matter further, take on board the views of interested parties, key stakeholders, couples, children and all of those involved in the process. Sorry, yes, go ahead. Mm. Sorry, I cut across her in mid-sentence there, which was a bit, um, which was a bit rude of me, but uh, thank, thank her for giving away. Um, is the Minister suggesting that she, it may be possible to include a provision on no-fault divorce in the law that I think is being prepared on... Um, Marital changes, including reducing the age limit, or sorry, increasing the <laughs> increasing the age limit. <coughs> to correct myself, well, it's been a long day. Uh, well, as the member will be aware, the um, the legislation that we're hoping to bring forward um, in relation to raising the, the marriage uh, age um, and in relation to beliefs marriage is is well developed, and we'll be hoping to introduce that or to bring or to move forward with, with that quite soon. Um, and I wouldn't want to hold it up while we were consulting and developing um, proposals in relation to, to, to divorce. Um, but I, I, as I have said, um, this is an issue that I am keen to see taken forward later in the, in the mandate. Um, and as such, I have already asked my officials to begin an engagement process with those who can make a con contribution to the development of policy on divorce. This is an area of interest not just for my department on the substantive law side, but also, as the, as the former Minister for Justice uh, referred to, for the Department of Justice and for the Court Service, who both have a very important role in terms of the operation of the divorce system. There are others who will, I am sure, take an interest in any potential reform, and there are very, various agencies, both inside and outside of government, who my department will want to engage with going forward. I hope that as options are scoped and as initial views are considered and assessed that we can begin to make progress towards reform. I believe the right time is right to begin that work. Blame and its attribution can create division, resentment, and in virtually every case it does not change or impact on the reality that a marriage is effectively over. We need to consider ways of how we can look past that and allow couples to work together to agree arrangements post-split that are best for them, their finances and, where relevant, their children. I therefore commend the motion brought today and will ask my officials to explore how can we can develop policy options relating to this important subject. Thank you, Minister. I call on Sinead Annis to conclude and wind up on the debate on the motion. Sinead, you have up to 10 minutes. Gurmi Yogit, uh, pre last Kankorla, and I just want to say I, I struggle to think of any circumstance where a person will be better off or happier being forced to stay in a marriage uh, where, to quote Mr Alistair, they were, they were married to a philanderer who was mistreating them, but perhaps that's just me. I want to thank the majority of members for their thoughtful and pragmatic approach to this debate and for the recognition that, like so much of our legislation, legislation around divorce is outdated and doesn't reflect the modern, evolving society that we live in. In winding on this motion, like other members, I want to draw uh, members' attention to the impact that separation and divorce has on children. Um, this is a major concern. Separa separation issues are the single most common issue for advice from the regional parenting support line. At present, children and young people in the north, caught in the middle of a poorly managed, high-conflict family court battles, are at risk of long-term trauma. Lengthy waits and acrimony involved in courtroom disputes often increase feelings of stress and anxiety for children and young people. 
The breakdown of a marriage can be agonising for all involved, especially children. Therefore, it is important that we put the best interests and welfare of our children and young people first. When parents decide to live apart, children often feel as if their world has been turned upside down. They can experience a wide range of emotions, including loss, anger and confusion. While many of these children and young people can bounce back from a divorce, others may experience long-term emotional and behavioural impacts. This can affect educational attainment, life opportunities and even cause self-harm. These feelings are often made worse by the fact that many children have to move home and sometimes school when parents uh, separate. Many families in this situation come under financial strain, even if, they do not have money, if, even if they did not have money worries before. Even if a parental relationship has been very tense, children and young people may still have mixed feelings about the separation. Many hold on to a wish that their parents may get back together. Whatever has gone wrong in a relationship, parents still have a very important part to play in their children's lives. The current fault-based divorce process can exacerbate conflict and have a hugely negative impact. Research demonstrates that frequent, intense and poorly resolved conflict negatively impacts the young people caught up in these situations. Children and young people should learn that conflict can be managed and that many relationships um, of all types do not last forever. As a society, we should be displaying kindness and understanding as well as assisting families to manage breakdown. Society in the North has changed and evolved, and it has many new cultures and family situations. However, policy is not keeping up with the needs of the population. <coughs> Despite the large number of children and young people affected and the considerable, considerable impact on families and the state, there is a clear lack of policy to help support parents in order for them to be able to put their children's needs first. That is why the introduction of no-fault divorce legislation is essential. The Gillen Review of Civil and Family Justice recommended that parents and other married couples should be supported to separate or divorce amicably rather than be required to apportion blame for the purposes of legal proceedings. Anything which can be done to reduce, acrimony, to reduce the acrimony couples endure and end the anguish that children and young people suffer is crucial. This motion is a step in the right direction to ensure better outcomes for all those who find themselves caught up in this situation. Going for forward, I'm encouraged to hear that my colleague, the Minister for Finance, uh, is considering bringing forward amendments um, to the matrimonial uh, clause order, uh, which may allow applications for divorce without apportioning blame to either party and to ease the stress on couples and children. We owe it to our children and young people to approach conflict um, as a result of family breakdown differently, to reduce the levels of anxiety for all involved and the mental health impacts leading to self-harm and increase referrals to child and adolescent mental health services. I encourage everybody to support the motion. Girl, may I Thank you, Sinead. So the question is that the motion stand in order, the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary of any noes. No. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Just heard one dissenting voice. Okay, so item seven on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Assembly Chief.